This week on The Computer Chronicles, the hottest new computer games. Think you could have prosecuted O.J. better than Marsha and Chris? Now you can be the prosecutor in a great new game called In the First Degree. Did you like Back to the Future? Did you watch Quantum Leap do time travel with a terrific new game from Sanctuary Woods called Buried in Time? If you like robot battle games, we'll show you the coolest one of them all, Mech Warrior 2. Plus, Sierra Online's Roberta Williams joins us for a look at her great new game, Phantasmagoria. A preview of new Windows 95 games, Finding Gamers on the Imagination Network, plus my pick of the week, looks at PlayStation versus Saturn. All this plus gaming on the net, this week's news, next on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers. Developing PCs for business. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. And Villa Crespo Software, makers of Go Figure, the problem solving toolkit. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Whenever I watch a trial on TV, I always think, let me get up there. I can do a better job than those attorneys. Well, now I and you can try with a really breakthrough new game from Broderbund called In the First Degree. Mike, I really love this game, so I'm going to shut up and show it to us. <laughs> All right. Well, this is Broderbund's first title since Mist, first entertainment title since Mist. Um, what it is, is it's a courtroom drama, an interactive courtroom drama, where you play a prosecuting attorney in this sensational San Francisco murder trial that is just happened, er, that that is going to take place, um, you. I'm just going to set it up for you here. You've just come home. Um, you've walked in. You're making yourself some dinner. Um, and I'm the prosecutor. I'm a you, prosecuting attorney. You are. You are Sterling Granger. You are the prosecutor who's going to take uh, take this to court. Um, now you see the five o'clock news. This will set the trial. And I hear about this murder. Exactly. So I find out like everybody else does these days. I watch TV. <laughs> you watch I'm the, the media. Okay. Good evening. A startling slaying is sending shockwaves through San Francisco tonight. Popular art gallery owner Zachary Barnes was found shot dead at his workspace. Right, the man so I know I've got a case to take on here. What do I do next? Yeah, you have a case. So what, you, what I'll do now is go to the main interface of the game. This is where the interactivity begins. Um, you can look at documents. These are pieces of evidence that have been collected at the crime scene, different um, pieces that have been taken from the witnesses themselves. I've just looked at the gun from the murder. Um, the shirt that the accused was wearing, just different things that... I'm looking for clues, ideas, exactly. to question the witnesses Exactly, so putting things together to build an airtight case. Um, these are also some tapes that were taken just after the murder, and um, your detective Looper, who is uh, your colleague, mm -hmm. is asking these people questions that could be very important to So to I can go case. back and actually look, can you roll those tapes? Yeah. So I can actually go back and look at these video interviews that were done by the, by the investigators. Sorry to keep you waiting. Exactly, okay. and this will give you an idea of what their reactions are and how you should handle them. In the and she's the girlfriend of the defendant. Exactly. The suspect, right. Um, we're going to go and talk to Yvonne now, who is uh, the the wife of the victim, mm -hmm. and you could really ask her questions that are going to be crucial to their to to where you go in the trial. Um, these are different things that you could ask her. We'll ask her about the gun quickly. What can you tell me about Zachary's cousin, Daryl Barnes? Mr. Granger, I have a question of my own first. Am I right to assume you have a pretty good case? We had a very good case until... And I... you can, in fact, decide what question to ask and what approach to take and to exactly. be tough or to be soft and exactly. all Exactly. It's very important to know whether you should coddle them or yeah. uh, get really tough And the with result them. may vary depending on exactly. how good you are at this. Exactly. We're going to go directly to trial now. Normally, you'd ask them more questions, gather more information, but it'll give you a good idea where we're going with the game and how there's really two pieces of the game. There's the pre-trial, gathering the information, yeah. interviewing the witnesses, 
And then once you get to trial, asking them important questions. What's really cool about the game is once you get to trial, you find out how you're doing each day by watching the TV news. Exactly. And these legal experts come on and say, hey, he did well, he did poorly, right? The media tells you everything in this game. So now we're in court. The, you're in court. The judge is introducing the case, and we'll introduce the jury to you and the defendant. The defendant and you're off and running. All right, and I have to ask you, was this inspired by the O.J. trial? Ha ha. It was actually two years prior to O.J. Oh, so all right. We got a good, good... Thank you very much, Mike. All right, with the advent of Windows 95, we're all looking for the software to take advantage of its 32-bit power. And leading the way will be new games. To make sure game programmers hop on board Win95, Microsoft held a mega gamers conference at their campus in Redmond, Washington. Here's what it was like. Stand them before the deity. <laughs> the room was dark. The theme was dark. It was Microsoft's Day of Judgment, a Windows 95 game rollout held underground at the company's headquarters. 35 game developers were there, dressed in appropriately ghoulish or devilish attire, but the demonic atmosphere was more a reflection of Halloween than of the software on display. Microsoft was celebrating the rise of Windows 95 as a game platform, using the company's new direct draw and direct input technologies. One of the things that you notice when you're playing a Windows 95 game is, again, video performance. That's probably one of the most noticeable things about a game. And a Windows 95 game is going to run at a much higher video resolution. The technology that underlies that is something called Direct Draw that enables game developers to go directly to your video hardware and take advantage of all the accelerators and all the other, you know, silicon that these people have been designing for years and years. The eye-popping graphics were everywhere to be seen. Virgin Interactive showed the 95 version of Daedalus Encounter with live-action video grown up to full screen size. And we need to know if you can respond. If you can, use the virtual interface in front of you to transmit a yes. Microsoft launched its first action arcade game called Fury, a futuristic space combat and rescue game with three parallel playing fields and 24 different missions. Microsoft also unveiled a new version of Microsoft Golf. Version 2.0 adds an online multiplayer game feature called PlayerNet. Get out. Not bad. Sony Interactive demonstrated its first titles for Windows 95 called Twisted Metal and Warhawk. Sony is porting the games from its PlayStation game console with similar look and feel. The Windows versions are expected to ship in 1996. For players craving sensory feedback, Judgment Day had some hardware innovations as well. Exos introduced the Power Stick, a joystick with force feedback. The hand grip responds to virtual forces according to the game. Crash your car and get a nasty jolt. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. If you bought the Journeyman Project or wish you had, you want to make sure and watch what's coming next. This is the sequel and another groundbreaking game from Sanctuary Woods called Buried in Time. Michelle is the president of Presto Studios. You're the guys who actually developed the game. That's correct. And this is about time travel. So first of all, show us the interface, Michelle. Sure. We're traveling through time in a fully self-contained bio suit. There's a little image of it here in the... Uh window and we have navigation controls here where we're able to move through inventory controls with objects that we're carrying if the computer needs to speak with you we use the message window and the biochips are the area where we can uh, sort of add extensions to the interface as you walk around and collect objects you can uh, extensions by new functions capabilities exactly. powers right all right where are we right now Michelle we are on the top of a Mayan temple in uh, Chichen Itza in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula and the year is 1050 and we're searching for evidence that will prove our innocence we've been framed for altering history and um, so here we are and we know that someone's been here before and we're looking for evidence. Mm -hmm. These are uh, Mayan hieroglyphs that we have here and I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce you to a character that's traveling with us. His name is Arthur and he's on one of our biochips and if I pull him up I can have him comment on Those the hieroglyphs. Are Mayan hieroglyphs. They had a pretty sophisticated pictograph. So there's right? a sort of sage guy who's Especially always with Mayan me and helps Mayan me understand what's going on and solve problems. That's right and okay. the game takes 40 or 50 hours to play and so this way you don't feel lonely as you're going through. I hope it only 
takes me four days. Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's show how you look at objects because that's really cool. Sure. Right? This is an object which I'm finding on the ground and I can pick it up and drag it into my inventory and then I can inspect that object. So here is a ceramic bowl which is filled with incense and traditionally you would use that as an offering to the gods in the temple. But uh, we're going to jump to another time zone. There are seven different environments um, in the game and we're going to go to Chateau Gaillard. This is the uh, medieval... So we're uh, jumping ahead a couple hundred years. Right. And going to France? For France. Normandy, okay. France. This is an English castle standing on French soil and it was Richard the Lionheart's castle. And uh, Philip Augustus desperately wanted to take the castle back mm -hmm. for France. And uh, when Richard died in the year 1203, they began a siege. This is nine months so later. So this stuff is all historically sound. This is all based on true yeah. actual fact. Yeah. It's a recreation of the real castle. Uh, this is one of the guards, which is one of the few remaining guards, and mm -hmm. uh, he meets a uh, demise here from a stray arrow from one of the French soldiers Lucky coming thing over for the us. Wall. Yes, because as a time traveler, you're not supposed to be spotted by people. Uh, it may actually affect the future. Um, what I want to do is I want to move from the top of the tower down inside so that you can see how that we're, we're changing the lighting and the mm -hmm. environment and also the audio. And when you play the game in a dark room with loud speakers, it becomes a very immersive environment. You get drawn into the story. It's very easy to lose yourself in the world. Or can we jump into the future real quick and show me that future part of it? Sure, program? absolutely. What I'll do is I'll recall to the future apartment. And this is 300 years in our future from uh -huh. today. And uh, it'll give you a good example of how our industrial designers are creating worlds and visualizing some of the technology changes. As an example, in this particular room, you don't need a roof because force fields are evolved enough mm -hmm. that as I look around, I'll be able to look up and be, see right out into the sky. And the thought is that people would like to live wow. in natural daylight uh -huh. settings and such. Okay, buried in time, and what kind of machine do I need to run it? On a PC, it would take a uh, 33 megahertz mm -hmm. uh, 486, and on a Mac, a 68040 or better. All right, Michelle, thank you very much. You. All right, next I want to introduce you to another great piece of software for gamers, but also, by the way, a piece of hardware for gamers. Before I get to the computer, this is Josh Resnick of Activision. Josh is going to show us this gigantic new game called MechWarrior 2. The machine we're running it on here, I want to explain, is really a PC designed for game players. This is a sort of $3,000 dedicated game machine. It's a 133 megahertz Pentium. It's got a 6X CD-ROM drive, a 1.6 gig hard drive. It comes with built-in MPEG, 45 watt speakers, and it comes bundled with 11 great games, including Mech Warrior and Buried in Time, which we just saw before. So this is the gamer's PC. All right, let's see how it does on Mech Warrior 2. Tell us what the game's about, Josh. Sure. Uh, Mech Warrior 2 is an action simulation set in the 31st century, and you are a pilot of one of these large battle mechs. And your goal is to advance in the ranks of your particular clan and become the leader. And All right, so I'm uh, one of these robot things you call a mech warrior. Exactly. And I can design my robot, and then I go into battle, and exactly. i got to beat all the other guys and rise to the top of right, my Right, right, exactly. Speak. But uh, th there's an incredible amount of depth and variety to the game. Right now, we're just in one of maybe 30 different terrains that are available in Mech. We have ice planets, and we have canyons, and we have nighttime urban missions. Now, the key thing, this is full 3D all the way around, right? Exactly. For Show instance, I can free up my eye point inside this cockpit, which is a real 3D object inside the game. Mm -hmm. Everything you're looking at is 3D. Um, it's a full screen game. And in fact, it, it actually recreates the, the physical aspects of the world that it's in. For instance, we're taking to a gravity, uh -huh. weight, size, weather. So it's a real simulation. It's a real simulation. All right, stop for a second and show me what's sure. on the screen because there's an awful lot of stuff going on here. Okay. Start with the upper right and what's that telling me? That's where you, that displays all your different weapon systems. So we have particle cannons and missiles and lasers. And so the weapons available to me on this particular mech. Bottom exactly. right is me. Exactly. Bottom right is is me. I'm invulnerable, so I'm not taking any damage right now. Okay. Bottom left is the bad guy I'm going exactly. after. Exactly. And I'm targeting him right now. And, and yellow you'll see means he's it, been damaged. Exactly. In that part. Right. And upper left is my my radar view. Uh huh. That's your radar view, and you can bring this full screen, uh -huh. or you can remove it from the screen. It's it's uh, it's really up to you. Okay, now, Mechware, you're playing against the computer right now. Right. But you actually have an ability on this to, with two guys to play over a modem, right? Exactly. Exactly. You can play head-to-head -head over a local area network, or you can play modem-to-modem. -modem. And under development right now is an eight-player, multiplayer wow. game. 
So <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun. It's 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 a great. Game. All right, take me to the top of the game and show me sure. how you pick the Mech Warrior and really design your robot because it's, this is not just shoot 'em up. I mean, there's strategy to figuring out what kind of machine is going to win in this environment. Right? Absolutely. In fact, there's a lot of strategy involved. You might have noticed that some of the other mechs in this mission were actually using their jump jets to try to jump on top of your head. So there's full aerial so combat decide, in the game. So decide, do I want jump jets in my mech warrior or some other tool, depending exactly. on who I'm fighting and where I'm fighting? Exactly. I'm going to take us back to our home planet right now, and I'll take you into the mech plant where the mech warrior can choose which mech he wants to go into battle in. There's 16 different mechs in the game. And all you have to do is just cycle through these different mechs, uh -huh. and you can use the interface to actually swap out which engine type you have, what type of weapons you have, which type of cool. mech you have, heat sinks, you name it, it can be changed. Minimum hardware for Mech Warrior 2 is? A 4666. Okay. Uh, but it always plays better on a Pentium. All right, thanks, Josh. Thank you. All right, sometimes it's fun to play a game against the computer, but one of the neat things about computers is that you can turn on your modem and take on other players from around the world. The Imagination Network, founded by Sierra Online, is a dedicated network for gamers. There are all sorts of game players. Computer game players, social players, and people who love to compete at any time, in person or in cyberspace. Sue Marinucci's job and family come first, but she has found a way to keep playing with some of her favorite adventure games with other like-minded players through an online service called the Imagination Network. You get to meet a lot of people online, and you learn a lot about people uh, all over the country here. And it's just kind of neat. you just playing and talking, and the interaction itself is what makes it worth it. It's just so much fun. <laughs> the Imagination Network is divided into five game categories called LANs. There's a Medieval Land for adventure games, Sierra Land for kids, and Casino Land for virtual gambling. To join, a new player establishes a graphic identity, choosing sex, facial type, and hairstyle. After choosing a nickname, Sue can join ongoing games or look for partners. The live competition can become exciting and addictive. I'm going to say it was before Spades came out, Hearts. We got into a Hearts game, and it was a four-player game, and um, we were all sitting around talking, and it was a very exciting game. That's what was neat. It was so exciting, and everybody was just getting along so well and talking, and um, just had an incredible time. And I remember it was 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Giles Bateman. One of the real pioneers in the computer game business is Roberta Williams. She and her husband Ken wrote their first game, I guess it was 15 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And they keep on pushing the edge with every new game. Roberta's newest game is called Phantasmagoria. And I tell you, I must, I must tell you, I love this game. I think it's the great interface for a role-playing game. I really feel like I'm inside the game. Show, tell us, first of all, what's the story of the game so we can set it up? Okay, you play the role of Adrienne Delaney, who you can see standing there. And uh, her and her husband have just moved into this kind of old haunted house that mm -hmm. was owned by a magician over a hundred years before. So a lot of weird stuff goes on yes, in this Yes, there's house. an evil in this house and, and, and it has taken over her husband at this point. Alright, so we've jumped ahead way near the end of the game. We're yes. into chapter seven. It's a mm -hmm. seven CD game, right? That's right. And uh, she, she now knows that her husband is possessed by this, by this evil uh -huh. entity and she wants to get out of there. So um, I can uh, direct her to leave. But at the beginning of chapter seven, the house is also being taken over by this evil. So she tries to leave what? and the house and won't it won't let her open go. the doors. That's right. It is locked her in. And again, what happens is, I mean, this, things change during the course of the game. Obviously, something that goes on in the room at one point, the room may act differently later on in the game, huh? That's right. And you can also go out and explore the island, the surrounding island, mm -hmm. and there's a town and shops and townspeople that you can meet. And it's a huge house, too. Lots of floors and lots of rooms. And Secret passages yeah, right. and hidden rooms. All right, so what is she doing now? Well, now she, uh, she has a hammer in her inventory, um, and this is one of the few places in the game where she's sort of decided on her own. Yeah, she normally we would have said, oh, let's take the hammer and try to break the glass right. to get out of the house. But in this case, um, for plot reasons, she's yeah. going to try to break the glass. She can't get out. We wanted to make that obvious to the player. So she um, knows something bad, go right. bad is going to happen now in this so story. So I'm going to cut this short a little bit so we can uh, see a little bit more. Um, take her upstairs, and we're going to meet her husband. 
Okay. Because uh, I just happen to know where her husband is, you just is happen hiding to wonder out, how you know. and we can see how crazy he has really okay. become. Can we do the disc swap here so we get to the next Not CD? yet. Okay. Almost. I'm going to hurry her up. If you hit the fast forward uh -huh. here, you can, you can hurry her up the stairs, otherwise you get to watch her walk. Okay, so she's going into the room where her yes. husband is, yes. and, and he yes. used to be the nice guy, and he's sort of been transformed in the game to the evil guy now. Yes. Oh, he was a very nice guy at the yeah. beginning of the game, and he was a normal husband, <laughs> and, you know, very loving, but he has don he's totally snapped at this point, and he is really out to kill her. While, while this is loading up, let me just ask you a second. I mean, as, as a game programmer, I mean, what's the next step? I mean, you keep on pushing and pushing, this stuff gets better and better. What's, your, what's the thing you'd like to be able to do next? Well, I think what I'm going to do is... Uh, is try to do a, an adventure game with all uh, a 3D moving world, uh -huh. a total 3D simulated moving world, yeah. um, but third person. I'm going to see if I can do that. Wow, that'd and that's going to be the next thing. I'm okay, what's happening here? Well, here I'm going to fast forward because we don't really have time. What I want to do is uh, start the chase. The husband has come in and met her. Um, he's crazy. He's going to kill her. Now at this point, the game goes very quickly, and you have 10 seconds to make your choice. Here is a bottle of uh, sulfuric acid that you happen to know is there. Mm -hmm. You have to grab it. So I clicked on it. She's going to grab it now, toss it in his face. Big secret to how to, how to yes. beat him at the end of the game. Yes, here, huh? and you better get out of there. Okay. And we have 10 second increments now um, where we can run and uh, make choices. And if you make the wrong choice, then he's going to yeah. get her. So and this is just the wee tip of the iceberg of this game. There's been all kinds of stuff that's going on before this, so oh, yeah. just a little hint of this it. This is just the very end of the game. So she's running, and if you stop at any point and, and dilly-dally around, he's going to get her. Again. That's right. Roberta, thank you very much. It's a great game. Thank you. All right, we showed you the Imagination Network before, but of course the Internet has become a fertile new playground for gamers. On this week's online update, Giles shows us one cool game site in cyberspace. Thanks, Stuart. No discussion of games and the Internet would be complete without the discussion of MUDs, multi-user dimensions, or multi-user dungeons, depending on your school of thought. They're basically real-time D&D games that are taking place uh, on the Internet with players all over the world. And they're not just Dungeons and Dragons. There are plenty of other themes as well. Now, uh, if you are interested to find out what MUDs exist, I recommend going to the MUD Connector, because they have a listing uh, of all the MUDs that they know of so far, listed in alphabetical order over here on the left, with the address of the actual site uh, right here next to it, and in some cases a home page so you can actually go and find out more about that particular MUD. So, for instance, if I find out about the Austin MUD, I want to check out their website, I could actually go and, and look up information about what's happening with the Austin MUD these days. These are sort of some imaginative uh, pieces of artwork here. You don't actually see uh, graphics on the uh, MUD while you're there, but now we can learn about uh, the different spells and legends and whatnot of this particular MUD. Now, if you're new to MUDs, I recommend going to the Rainbow MUD first. Now, I'm going to hop into my particular uh, MUD application, and uh, if you don't have a MUD application, you can use Telnet. And what you do is you come here, and I recommend going to the Rainbow MUD and going north first, just typing in to go north, because then it, this will walk you through in a MUD environment and it'll teach you how to play MUDs and all the types of commands that you can use. Now, time for our weekly summary of what's new in the field of personal computing. Here's Lori with Random Access. In the Random Access file this week, Intel has officially introduced the Pentium Pro, its next generation CPU. The new microprocessor has 5.5 million transistors and it's capable of producing workstation quality graphics for games and movies. Sun Microsystems has unveiled a new computer architecture for its workstations and servers. The system is called Ultra Computing and Sun claims it provides supercomputer processing power in a desktop workstation. Got too much to read at work? Well, a new automated text summarizer technology will be available soon. It's called Intel X, and it can look at the entire text of a business article and extract the relevant themes. It will first be available online as part of the Intel X information services aimed at the corporate network market and then be made available as a desktop product. If you're not quite ready to upgrade to Windows 95, a company called Panther Software has come up with a new add-on product that offers many of the file handling features found in Windows 95. The product is called Office Central and it lets you create folders based on subject, place files in folders and preview file content as well as drag and drop between folders. Street price for Office Central is expected to be under 50 bucks. 
Televideo has announced the first ever multi-purpose multimedia card. It's called the All Media Processor Board, and it includes an MPEG player with Sound Blaster compatible audio, a video and graphics accelerator, a TV tuner, and data fax modem, all on one expansion board. AT&T has started yet another online venture. This one is called the AT&T Health and Fitness Service. It will feature digital news from the New England Journal of Medicine and the Mayo Clinic, among others. Our content is different. Um, we've been very careful about all the content that we have from a reliability and a quality standpoint. And the data clearly indicates when you go out and uh, survey Americans, that today there are a lot of people looking on the internet for health <coughs> information, but there is not the kind of quality of information that Americans are really looking for, for from a trusted source like Mail Clinic. Thinking of buying the kids new software for the holidays, you might want to check out Family PC Magazine for December. It will feature a software handbook that has tips on where and how to buy the right software for your family. And if hardware is on your gift list, you might want to look at the new No Hands Mouse. You use your feet. It's a gas pedal like controller that uses a 360 degree pressure sensitive mechanism, which allows you to control both speed and direction of a cursor with just one foot. And finally, Nintendo has announced it has sold its one billionth video game cartridge. If you were to put those cartridges end to end, they would circle the world almost three times. That's it for this week's Random Access. Back to you, Stuart. Now for my pick of the week. If you love playing computer games, I'm sure you've been through the debate, either for yourself or for your kids, about whether it's worth buying a video game system if you already own a computer. After all, the PC has become a darn good game platform, as we have just seen. If you've gotten past that question, though, the tough choice is really between the two new 32-bit game systems. This is the Sega Saturn over here, and we're looking at a great game on this called Panzer Dragoon. Let me punch up the other one. This is the Sony PlayStation. This is a terrific game called Battle Arena Toshinden. Now, you will hear arguments on both sides of this one. Some like the Saturn, some like the PlayStation. I think it's pretty darn close when it comes to the hardware itself. The real issue is which platform will get the best games written for it. And it's probably too soon to say, though, Sony seems to maybe have a slight lead there right now. What I want to suggest is that a dedicated game machine, whether the Sega or the Sony, is a good idea, even if you own a PC. My main reason, well, to be honest, as great as the games are that are out there today for the PC, half the time they won't install on your computer. If you really like gaming, it's nice to know that when you come home from the store having spent 50 bucks for a new game, it'll work. With a video game console, you don't run into not enough RAM, not enough video, not enough hard drive, not the right sound card, etc. That is worth a lot. One last point. If you have one of these neat new big screen projection TVs, there is nothing like plugging in your video game console and really immersing yourself into the game world in that theater-like setting. So don't kiss off the dedicated game consoles. And remember, this way, while your kids are playing games, you can still be using the computer. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with another half hour of the latest in personal computer technology. I'm Stuart Chaffee. See you here next time. Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Hewlett Packard Personal Computers, developing PCs for business. Additional funding from the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. And Villa Crespo Software, makers of Go Figure, the problem solving toolkit. Videotape copies of all Computer Chronicle shows are available for $32.50. Please order by show number and topic. And for more detailed information about the series, guests, and products featured, you can also order a subscription to the Chaffee Letter. In each issue, Stewart provides his unique insights and thoughts about the fast-changing world of personal technology. Videotapes and the Chaffee Letter can be ordered by calling 1-800-800-9520 or by writing us at the Computer Chronicles.